We're back on the adventure of the Bible. Still hanging around in Genesis for the most part. And in this one, I want to talk about how you can discover the entire Bible within the book of Genesis. The major things that you see throughout the Bible, you can discover within the book of Genesis. In Genesis 1, obviously, you've got in the beginning. Of course, Genesis, being the book of beginnings, tells you how it's all started. It shows you the beginning of rebellion. In Genesis 1, 1 through 2, you know, you got in the beginning, God created, in the, he created the heaven and the earth. And then you got the gap in there. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And within those first two verses, most likely that's where you got the rebellion of Lucifer and... Most likely, angels fell with him at the time. And it shows you the beginning of rebellion. It shows you the beginning of man in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. It shows you the beginning of Bible correctors in Genesis 3, 1 through 3. You've got Eve and you've got the serpent. And they both correct what God said. You've got the beginning of Bible correctors. You've got the beginning of the promised seed in Genesis three fifteen. The first direct prophecy of the Lord Jesus in Genesis 3.15. You got the beginning of storms with the story of Noah in Genesis 6 through 9. The first time it ever rained. You got the beginning of the nation of Israel in Genesis 15, 5 through 6. So it shows you the beginning. It shows you the beginning of the heaven. It shows you the beginning of the earth. It shows you the beginning of creatures, sin, death, the races, the nations. And so on and so forth. It shows you that everything begins with God, as he said. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. So, in this book, our tour guide, the Lord Jesus Christ, begins his Bible with Genesis. And in Genesis, he's going to show you prophecies, pictures, and types of of the rest of the major events of Scripture. So let's look at some of them. So Genesis 1, you had the beginning. And of course, your Bible starts out with the beginning. But then you go over to Genesis chapter 2, and it talks about the tree of life, and it talks about the Garden of Eden. You know, think about that for a minute. Your Bible starts out with the tree of life, and it starts out with the Garden of Eden. And you discover the whole Bible within the book of Genesis. Well, by the time you get to the end of the Bible, you've got the millennium talked about in Revelation 20, and you've got the tree of life talked about in Revelation 21 and 22. And in Ezekiel 36, 35, look what it says. And they shall say, This land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. You see that? In the millennium, God's going to make it like the Garden of Eden again. And you'll find the tree of life out in eternity. In Revelation twenty two fourteen, it says, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Me and you, saved born-again Christians in the body of Christ, are going to leave this sinful world one day and be in a perfect creation one day. You see, He ends the book like He started the book but way better, a better garden. And you're going to have people eating from a tree of life, but without fear of the serpent. Now me and you, we already ate from the tree, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our tree of life. But you're going to have people eating from a tree out there in eternity. You see how Genesis is the beginning, but it's showing you the whole Bible. It's showing you the tree of life. It's showing you the Garden of Eden. It's showing you what it's going to be like. You see, before the fall in Genesis 2, Adam and Eve was living similar to how people's going to be living out in eternity. You also think about Adam and Eve. You know, in Genesis 2 as well, Adam had a deep sleep come on him. And, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ had a deep sleep fall on him, and he was pierced in his side to get his bride, just like Adam in Genesis 2 was pierced in his side to get his bride. 
You know, he, he had a deep sleep come on Adam, and he took the rib out of Adam and made Eve. Well, when Jesus Christ, our Adam, or the last Adam, was on the cross in John 19, 34, it says, And one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came out blood and water. So the last Adam died to get his bride. He was pierced in the side to get his bride. And then the first Adam was pierced in his side to get his bride. That just amazes me. It amazes me, the, the similarities and how the Lord shows you through these pictures and types and prophecies he shows you the whole bible he shows you himself now genesis 3 the famous chapter the fall of man the serpent tempts the bride the serpent tempts eve he tempts the bride while the groom isn't around while she's waiting on the groom to come back the serpent shows up and tempts the bride just as right now in this present time you're in, the church age, the devil is tempting us, the bride of Christ, right before Jesus Christ comes back. And that's what he's doing all throughout the church age. He's trying to trip you up. He's walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You see how that that's written back there in the Old Testament? It's showing you things that are happening right now and things that haven't even happened yet. You're, you're discovering the tour guide is showing you the whole Bible in the book of Genesis. The, this is what he's talking about all through. This is what the devil's doing all through the church age, trying to trip you up, trying to tempt you while you wait on the groom to come back. You know, in Genesis 3, the man takes on sin and dies. Adam takes on sin and dies because he loves his bride Eve. Jesus Christ took on sin and died because he loved the bride. And in Genesis 3.15, you've got the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ bruising the head of the serpent. And throughout the scriptures, you'll see the devil's men get a head wound. And that's exactly what happens in Revelation 13. The Antichrist, the devil's seed, gets a deadly head wound. Then you turn over the page to Genesis chapter 4. you got Cain killing Abel, his brother, out of envy. And you know what? Uh, capital punishment hadn't been instituted yet, so God puts a mark on Cain so that nobody can kill him. And, you know, Cain is a type of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist also has a mark. Revelation 13, 16 through 17. So you see the mark on the devil's man. The devil's man associated with a mark. Just like in Revelation 13, the devil's man associated with the mark. You turn the page, you get to Genesis 5, you got Enoch. And Enoch was not, for God took him. And you look in Hebrews 11:5, it talks about Enoch again. It says, by faith, Enoch was translated. You, you, people say, well, the rapture ain't in the Bible. Well, there's your, word, there's your word for the rapture translated. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For Before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. This is a picture of saints who are alive at the rapture getting caught up without ever dying. You see, if the rapture happened right now, and if you don't know what the rapture is, you need to read 1 Corinthians 15. You need to read 1 Thessalonians 4. And that's where me and you, people that are saved, one of these days the Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And Enoch pictures those who are alive and remain. Like if the rapture happened right now, me and you that are alive and remaining, we're going to get caught up in the rapture and we'll never see death. Just as Enoch was translated, that he should not see death. So you see the picture. You see how everything in Genesis is showing you the whole Bible. And then you got in Genesis 5, you've got all of these people named and they're living so many years. For example, in Genesis 5, 27, and all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. 969 years. 
I can't imagine living 969 years. I can't imagine living uh, to be 70, 80 years. When I see people that are older, I, I'm just amazed I, I, and I'm impressed. And you ought to be amazed and impressed and, and honor people that are older because they've had to live in this old sinful world that many years. When you get up into 70, 80, 90 years, that's impressive that you've went that long and lived that long. But imagine Methuselah, 969 years. These pre-flood ages, though, it pictures what it's going to be like in the millennium. Because in the millennial reign, now if you don't know what the millennial reign is, the millennial reign is something that happens... After the rapture, after the tribulation, after the second coming, the Lord, see, the Lord's going to come back at the second coming and he's going to set up a kingdom on this earth and he's going to reign for a thousand years, but that's just the kickoff for eternity where he's reigning forever. But he's going to reign on this earth in the millennial reign. Revelation 20 talks about a 1,000 year reign. It says 1,000 years six times in there. And during that time, you're going to have people living a really long time. In Isaiah 65, 20, it says, There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old. But the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. You see, the child shall die an hundred years old. It would be like a child dying if he died at a hundred years old. You get to Genesis chapter 6. And you see a Hall of Fame character again named Noah. And that makes sense because his great-great-grandpa Enoch that we just talked about was also in the Hebrews 11 Hall of Faith as well. Yeah, Enoch that got raptured out before dying, that was Noah's great-great-grandfather. And Noah's papa uh, Methuselah was the oldest man who ever lived. And he would have been alive when Adam was alive. Methuselah was Enoch's son. And he, uh, Methuselah would have been alive when Adam was alive. And imagine the old man stories that Methuselah would have given to Noah growing up. You, you know, you have a, if you have a papa, you know that he's got all these stories about when he was younger, what things was like when he was growing up. Well, imagine what Methuselah could have told Noah. He may have met Adam. A time or two. So imagine what Noah, Noah would have knew. Imagine what Methuselah would have knew. You know, living all those years, those years, they are, are a picture of what, how it's going to be in the millennium. But this man Noah, in Genesis 6, 9, it says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. That's a picture of me and you. We are perfect in our generations. Not like Noah, not like it's talking about like Noah was, but because me and you got regenerated and got put in the line of Christ. And the second part, it says Noah walked with God. If you're saved, the first part is like you. You're perfect in your generations now. You've been regenerated. But the second part isn't true for all Christians. It says Noah walked with God. Are you walking with God? You see, that's the difference in your standing and your state. You're perfect in your generations. If you're saved, you've been regenerated. But are you walking with God in the flesh? That's your state. In Genesis 6, 10, and 11, it says, And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's where you're, That's where all everybody's going to come from, is from them three men right there. It says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. That's the way it was in Noah's day. But did you know the time Noah lives in is a perfect picture of a future time in your Bible, the tribulation time period that you read about in Matthew 24, that you read about in Revelation, um, mostly 6 through 18, that future horrible time period. And you know what the Lord calls it in Matthew 24, 37? But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You see that? How the Lord Himself calls that tribulation time period the days of Noah. You see how 
your tour guide is showing you. The Lord Jesus Christ shows you the whole Bible through the book of Genesis. Then you get to Genesis 7. You got the first time it ever rained. It was unlike anything the world ever seen. Just like in Matthew 24, 21, the Lord said, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. You get to Genesis 8 through 9. And it says in Genesis 8, 6, it says, And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Now the window of the ark pictures that window up in heaven. And in Genesis 8, 7, it says, And he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Now those unclean birds like ravens picture unclean spirits. And when he lets go of that raven, it pictures Satan getting kicked out of heaven and going to and fro until the waters are really dried up. And you know when the waters really dry up is in Revelation 21 and verse 1 where it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now that's talking about that sea up under that sea of glass. And that's where Leviathan is in them deeps up there. And you see, he's the devil, like that raven, he went out of that window of that ark and he's going to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. And the devil, he's going to and fro. Just like it talks about in Job, where he go, he's going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And he's going to do that until there's a new heaven and a new earth. You see, he gets bound for about a thousand years over there in Revelation 20, but he gets let out again. And then the, devil finally, or the Lord finally puts him in a lake of fire and... Uh, just blows everything up and then there ain't going to be no more devil no more and then it says in Genesis 8 8 through 9 and he sent forth a dove from him no so Noah sends a dove out of the ark to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground but the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot and she returned unto him into the ark for the waters were on the face of the whole earth then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. You see, the dove pictures the Holy Spirit, and it doesn't find rest. It's not finding any rest in the earth. And that's a picture of how it doesn't find any rest from Adam to the law. But in the church age, it finds rest in the believers. And like the Holy Spirit, we shouldn't find rest in the earth. We need to find rest in him, in the Lord. It says in Genesis 8 9, But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her, and pulled her in unto him into the ark. Now this picture is the rapture. Noah pictures the Lord uh, reaching out and grabbing the saints that can't find no rest in the earth. And just we just so happen to be sealed by the Holy Spirit, pictured by the dove, so that pictures the rapture, him pulling the dove in. And then you got Genesis 8.10, And he stayed yet other seven days, and again sent forth the dove out of the ark. Now that pictures the tribulation. The dove comes in and stays seven days, picturing the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. And now he lets the dove loose again, and it comes back with an olive leaf, which pictures the nation of Israel. And Genesis 8, 11, And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. So what you have there is a picture of the restoration of Israel after the seven-year trib. See how, see how the Lord shows you. You discover the entire Bible reading the book of Genesis. Right there, we've just already discovered the church age, the rapture, the tribulation, the millennium, eternity, already all these things about the lord jesus christ already just in the first nine chapters then you got genesis 10 nimrod shows up and nimrod his name means rebel which makes sense because he's the 13th from adam the number 13 is the number of rebellion he's also associated with babylon genesis 10 10 the beginning of his kingdom was babel so you see that the wicked babylon that shows up throughout the Bible and 
shows up in Revelation 17 and 18. So in Genesis 11, you've got the Tower of Babel and a one world government. Just like the Antichrist is going to bring in Nimrod, a top of the Antichrist. Brought in a Tower of Babel and a one world government. The Antichrist is associated with Babylon and a one world government. Then you get to Genesis 12, and things take a turn because you got Abraham. And the first Jew, he's the first Jew. This is a key to your Bible. From here on out, the Bible is about Israel and the Jews. And today in the church age, the Lord is dealing with the body of Christ, but he's going to go back to dealing with Israel in the tribulation. But Abraham is the first Jew. And you know what he says to Abraham in Genesis 12, 2 through 3? He says, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And that's what you see throughout the Bible, is God dealing with Abraham and his descendants. In Genesis 13, it describes how the men of Sodom and Gomorrah are wicked sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And you know what? The Lord in the Bible and other places in the Bible, he'll use Sodom and Gomorrah to illustrate how nations will be destroyed at the second coming. The same way they get destroyed with fire and brimstone, that's how he's going to destroy man at the second coming. He's going to come in flame and fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And in Zephaniah 2.9, he uses Sodom and Gomorrah to describe how he's going to destroy some nations. You get over to Genesis 15. It talks about Abraham's faith in his seed, and that's how he got righteousness for believing God about his seed, which is a match of me and yours faith today. Faith today, how we uh, get righteousness through faith in the Lord. He got righteousness through faith and believing about his seed. We get righteousness through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Genesis 15, 5 through 6, and read Romans 4. That's what the whole chapter is about. Paul comparing uh, Abraham's faith in his seed to our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you got Genesis 19, God overthrows Sodom and Gomorrah. And in Luke 17, 28 through 29, the Lord talks about how that tribulation time period is going to be like as it was in the days of Lot. That's how it's going to be right before the Son of Man is revealed, as it was in the days of Lot. Not just the days of Noah, but as it was in the days of Lot. You see how amazing the book of Genesis is? You discover the whole Bible through the book of Genesis. Then you got Genesis 22. You got Abraham going to offer Isaac. And the whole thing is a picture of the crucifixion. You know, Isaac is the son that God promised to Abraham. And he has him take his son, his only son Isaac, it says. Just like Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And Abraham the Father is going to offer his only son. Just like the, the Father offered the only begotten Son. And you know what? It said take, he took two young men with him. Just like in Genesis 22, Abraham took two young men with him. You know, when Abraham was going up there with Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice, you know, he took two men with him. He took two young men with him. Now, what does that remind you of? When Jesus Christ was crucified, he had two men with him, the two dying thieves. You know, Abraham laid the wood on Isaac. Jesus Christ had a wooden cross placed on him. You know, Isaac, you know, on the way up, he said, you know, here's the wood for the burnt offering. But you know, where's the lamb? And what did Abraham say? He said, God will provide himself a lamb. And that's exactly what he did. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh and he provided himself as the lamb. And then, you know, Abraham, he's going through with it because he believes in the resurrection of his dead son. He believes that if he kills Isaac, that... The Lord's going to resurrect Isaac because Isaac is the promised seed and that that shows that Abraham's faith in the promised seed was the real deal, that he really believes. And 
you know, he's he's about to he's take he's got the knife up, he's about to to kill Isaac, and then the angel of the Lord comes down and says, you know, now I know, now I know you you believe, and then they look over and there's a ram caught in a thicket by his horns, and you know that's significant because the ram's caught in a thicket by his horns. That pictures the crown of thorns. So it changes from Isaac being a picture of the Lord Jesus there to the ram being a picture of the Lord Jesus. Because Jesus wore a crown of thorns. But the whole chapter, Genesis 22, Abraham going to sacrifice Isaac, pictures the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. You get to Genesis 24, you got Abraham's servant Eliezer is going to find a wife for Isaac who ends up being Rebecca, and Eliezer says to her, or her family says to her, wilt thou go with this man? And she says, I will go. She says she would go with this man. You think about that for a minute. It's a picture of our salvation. You know, Isaac is a picture of Jesus Christ. Eliezer pictures the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's convicting you about being a member of the bride of Christ, being a part of the bride, and you make the free will decision to go with this man, the man Christ Jesus. And you know, me and you are like Eliezer, Abraham's servant. We need to be going out and trying to get people to be a part of the bride, willing people who will call on the name of the Lord and becoming a part of the bride of Christ, pictured by Isaac. You get to Genesis 27, Isaac blesses Jacob, his son, and this will be a name that you see throughout the whole Bible to refer to Israel. A lot of times when the Bible says Jacob, it's referring to Israel. God will refer to the nation of Israel as Jacob. You get to Genesis 29 through 30. Jacob marries Leah and Rachel. He also takes their handmaids Zilpah and Bilhah as wives. And with these women, he has 12 sons, which will make up the 12 tribes of Israel. And these 12 tribes you will hear about throughout the entire scriptures. Do you understand the importance of the book of Genesis? And how it just, you, you discover the whole Bible through the book of Genesis. Such an important book. In Genesis 30, 22 through 24, Rachel, Jacob's wife, is barren. And she has Joseph. Joseph was a miracle birth. Joseph, possibly the greatest type of the Lord Jesus Christ in the whole Bible. You can find uh, similarities between Joseph and the Lord Jesus Christ in over 150 ways. Joseph was a miracle birth, just as Mary giving birth to Jesus was a miracle birth. Mary had a virgin birth. Rachel was barren, and she, the Lord opened her womb, and she had Joseph. In Genesis thirty twenty four, the Lord gives Jacob a son in his old age, which is Joseph, after his wife Rachel had been barren. So this is a miracle birth. Compare it to the virgin birth. Mary was a virgin, and the father is God, who is the ancient of days, the son of his old age, just as Jacob had a son in his old age. You get on down to Genesis 35, and the Lord renames Jacob to Israel. So those 12 boys are called the children of Israel. And everyone from those sons are the children of Israel. So you see that? You understand that? That's, that's a key that you need to understand. Is I think that I told you the wrong chapter. It's Genesis 32 that Jacob's name is changed to Israel, not Genesis 35. But that's where you get the, child, the saying, the children of Israel, because they come from Jacob. Jacob has the 12 sons who become the 12 tribes who make up the children of Israel, and Jacob has his name changed to Israel. So that's where the name Israel comes from. And you're going to see that throughout the entire Bible. You get to Genesis 37. Joseph is the son who's hated. All their brothers reject Joseph. And remember, Joseph is one of the greatest types of Jesus Christ in the Bible. Let's just go over Joseph a minute, being a type of Christ, because, I mean, Joseph's life lays out the 
is a great picture of the entire ministry of Jesus, earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus. You know, Joseph is a miracle birth. Both are the firstborn to their mothers. Uh, Joseph was in a strange place as Jesus left heaven for a strange place. Joseph is a shepherd, Genesis 37, 2. Jesus is a shepherd, 1 Peter 5, 4. The sheep know his voice, John 10, 4. He gives his life for the sheep, John 10, verse 11 and verse 15. Joseph has half-brethren, just like Jesus has half-brethren, in Mark 6, 3 through 5, and Genesis 37, 2. Uh, Joseph brought his brother's evil report to his father. Jesus testified that the works, that the world's works are evil. John 7, 7. Israel, which is Jacob, loved Joseph more than all of his other sons. Just as the father loved the Lord Jesus. That's Genesis 37.3 for Joseph and Mark 1.11 for Jesus. Joseph is the son of Jacob's old age. Jesus is the only begotten of the eternal God's old age. Uh, G that's Genesis 37.3 for Joseph and Daniel 7.9 for the Lord Jesus. Uh, Joseph and Jesus both have significant coats that's genesis 37 3 and john 19 23 uh, jesus is our high priest and the high priest has a coat of many colors you know blue purple scarlet gold uh, that's exodus 28 4 through 5 and 31 through 35 you can see that the high priest has a coat of many colors. Jesus Christ is our high priest. Joseph had a coat of many colors made for him by his father, Jacob. Joseph and Jesus were both hated. That's Genesis 37, 4 and John 15, 18. Joseph was hated for his dreams as Jesus was hated for his parables. That's Genesis 37, 5 and Mark 12, 12. Joseph says, hear, tells them to hear, open, listen and hear in Genesis 37, 6. What's one of Jesus' favorite sayings? He that hath an ear, let him hear in Matthew eleven fifteen. 15. Uh, Joseph dreams of sheaves. His sheaf stands upright and the rest of the sheaves bow down to him. Picturing his brothers who will one day bow down to him, as you'll read about in the book of Genesis. And the brothers are so mad, they say that he will never rule over them. And this matches when Jesus came in the flesh and the Jews rejected him and wouldn't accept him as king. That's Luke one thirty three and Luke 19.14. And the first dream that Joseph has matches the Lord's coming to earth. Because of the sheaves. And then uh, this dream in Genesis 37 9 matches the second coming because it involves the celestial, it involves the stars. You see, that first dream, it was about the sheaves, about an earthly, it's a, it uh, matches the earthly coming. The second dream in Genesis 39 matches the second coming because it involves the celestial. It involves the stars. And the second time Jesus comes, he will come straight down through the heavens. Jesus was delivered to death because of envy. Genesis 37, 11. Uh, Joseph was delivered because of envy. Jesus was delivered because of envy. That's stated in uh, Matthew 27, 18 and Mark 15, 10. Both Joseph and Jesus are sent by their father to the brethren. That's Genesis thirty-seven thirteen, and John three seventeen. You know Jesus was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel in Matthew fifteen twenty-four, and John one eleven. It says he came into his own, and his own received him not. Just like Joseph, Joseph went to his brethren, and his own received him not. They rejected him. 
the father expected their sons to return. And uh, Genesis thirty-seven fourteen. you know, Joseph or Jacob expected Joseph to return, but he didn't. His brothers plotted against him and they thought they killed him or they thought they sold him off and they probably thought he eventually ended up dead, but he didn't. You know, the, the father expected the son to return and he did. You get over to Genesis 41, 45, and Pharaoh gives Joseph a Gentile bride. How about that? That amazes me. Joseph, their greatest type, a Jesus Christ in the Bible, is given a Gentile bride, just like the Lord Jesus Christ has a Gentile bride. In Genesis 41, 46, Joseph was 30 years old when he became second ruler in Pharaoh's kingdom. Well, Jesus Christ was 30 years old in Luke 3.23, when he started his earthly ministry. In Genesis 42 through 44, during a time of trouble and famine, picturing the time of Jacob's trouble, and Jacob is feeling some a lot of sorrow because he's lost his beloved son Joseph, you see. The time of Jacob's trouble. During a time of trouble and famine, Joseph's brothers have to go to Egypt to get bread. And then in Genesis... And let me tell you this, this is the beginning of how Israel ends up in Egypt. If you're wondering why they end up in Egypt in book of Exodus, how did they get there? It's because they were going to Egypt to get bread from Joseph, who they didn't know was Joseph at first. But this is the beginning of how Israel ends up in Egypt. And also remember, this pictures the time of trouble and the tribulation where there is famine. And Genesis 45, they realize that Joseph is the second ruler in Egypt. And this time, the second time around, they accept him. Just like the first time Jesus Christ shows up to his brethren the first time, he came into his own and his own received him not. He came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Israel rejected him. They said, crucify him. His blood be on us and on our children. But the next time he comes, they won't crucify him again. The next time he comes, they're going to look on him whom they have pierced. And they're going to mourn for him. And they're going to believe. Just like the second time, Joseph's brothers accept him. You get to Genesis 49 and you got a great prophecy on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Genesis 49.10, it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Jesus Christ is the line of the tribe of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Jesus Christ, that's shallow. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his fall unto the vine, and his ass was called unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the, in the blood of grapes. That's the second coming, where he stomps the people like they're grapes. Revelation 14, 20. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and the blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. You get to Genesis 50, the last chapter. And in Genesis 50 and verse 20, it says, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. That's Joseph saying to his brothers. He said, you guys thought evil against me. You guys put me in that pit with no water. You guys sold me off. Sold me off for silver. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph, by being in Egypt, ended up saving his family. Jesus Christ, you know, they crucified him. They meant it for evil. But God meant it for good to save much people alive. So, wow, you, you look at the book of Genesis, what an adventure. And if this doesn't make you love the Bible and get interested in the Bible, I don't know what will. It's just it's an adventure that keeps going and going and going. And I, I didn't even scratch the surface. I'm just giving you uh, like an overview of Genesis and showing you that you can discover the whole Bible within the book of Genesis by looking at the pictures, the types, the prophecies, the similarities. It's all in there. So the best thing that you can do, get you a Bible, a King James Bible, 
preferably get you a wide margin Bible, start reading it every day, marking that thing up. I got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of probably over a thousand lessons on here. Get you a Bible, get you some Micron pens, get you a wide margin Bible, start taking notes, mark the Bible up. It's an adventure you can start today and it, it'll last you a lifetime.